as we turn to God's Word. Uh, it's an interesting chapter in the life of David. Um, it's really a chapter that you wouldn't really believe what David did, being a man after God's own heart. Uh, but where he was led, uh, where fear led him, uh, where discouragement led him, where doubt led him, and it really paints a different picture of the David that we saw as a young boy at 15, standing, facing Goliath. It really is miraculous. But what we seek to look to see this morning is the faithfulness of God. That's why we sang those hymns, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord God, unto me. And David was a servant of God. And David ran away from God. But God was still faithful. And God proved his faithfulness to him. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 27. And David said in his heart, I want you to note that. It wasn't true. He maybe never said it to anyone else. He maybe didn't even say it to God. He didn't say it to anyone else, I presume. But he said it in his heart. And you'll know when you say something in your heart, you believe it. And that can cause lots of problems. David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me then I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to speak, to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. David arose. He passed over with 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. You'll notice here that David, in his discouragement, in his doubt, in his wrong thought, not only went himself, but he took 600 men with him. Verse 3, And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the Carmelite, Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. And David said unto Achish, <clears throat> If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Siglag that day. Wherefore Siglag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines, now listen, the time that he dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. Sixteen months. Where are we now? Say we're at the start of August. We will be next week. So August, September, October, November. He stayed there from now until November 2025. This was not a short-term thing with David. David had said this in his heart, and David had went down to the land of the Philistines to dwell for 16 months. And verse 8, And David and his men went up <coughs> and invaded the Gerasites and the Gezrites, the Amalekites, 
those nations were of old inhabitants of the land. As thou goest to Sir, even unto the land of Egypt. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive, took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels, the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to God, saying this, they should tell on us, saying, so did David, and so will be his manner. All the while he would dwell in the country of the Philistines. And Achish believed David, saying, he have made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. <coughs> Maybe we could have a quiet time of prayer, as I always like to do, and give you a chance to pray unto God. I certainly need your prayers that this voice will just hold out this morning. And um, uh, Let us have a short time of prayer, and then I'll, I'll finish off with a prayer indeed. Let us pray together. Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. We bring our hearts to you. Lord, because you and you alone are the only one that sees our heart. And we ask you, Lord, that you would speak to us, each and every one of us, through your word. We thank you that you've recorded so much for us to read and for us to understand. We thank you here for recording for us this dark period in David's life. And yet, Lord, only in a few chapter, chapters later, we read that David encouraged himself in the Lord. And we thank you that, Lord, that you don't leave us nor forsake us. We thank you that, Lord, that you've blessed us. We pray that, Lord, that you will come afresh to us. We pray that, Lord, that you would help us, encourage us, and strengthen us. Because all we really have this morning is God. And we thank you that, Lord, that for those of us that are saved, that's all we need and that's all we want. We thank you for the blessings that you bestowed upon us. But it's God that we need. It's God that we want. We pray that you would receive all the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> Here we are, as I've already intimated, at a dark time in David's life when he found himself discouraged. He found himself indeed alone. Uh, just a few months ago, I remember sharing with you a time in Daniel's life uh, when it said in Daniel chapter 2, and I believe verse 9, that Daniel said, 
he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. You see, he did it with his heart, and God blessed him. But here we are, in contrast, this morning, in the opening verses of chapter 27, and David said in his heart, and this wasn't something that was of God, but he said it in his heart. It meant that he meant it meant that he meant what he was saying. And what did he say in his heart? He says, "I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul." He was saying this in his heart, but it was obviously a wrong thought that he was thinking. But nevertheless. He was thinking it. Of course, the darkest thoughts that we can think can come in the darkest of situations. And they're usually, if not always, wrong thoughts. I mean, you could be in the workplace and all of a sudden you could think something about something that something, someone has said or someone that has done. You could come home to the home place, the wife or the husband or the children, and think something that's not right. Everything was against David, of course, for a large part of his life. And indeed, his life was one of constant battle. Every time I'm asked to give a word of testimony of what Christ has done in my life, I always start my testimony that whenever the Lord saved me, that's when the battle began. And because of David's sin, the Lord indeed had said to him that the sword would not depart from his house. But what made David great I mean, when we read these words this morning, we're not thinking of a great king, are we? We're, we're thinking of someone in defeat. We're thinking of someone that has allowed discouragement to come into their life. And they, 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 instead of putting it out, they have d- dwelt in that discouragement. They, they have found themselves dwelling in the discouragement. But what made David great was not the people around him or his surroundings. No, it was the God that was in him. It was the God that was for him. It was the God that had come to him and had anointed him to be king over his people Israel. One of my favorite stories in the life of David is in 1 Samuel 24. When Saul took 3,000 of his men to hunt David, in verse 2, it says Saul came into the cave where David and his men were, and Saul's back was against the wall. And David could have killed him. In fact, David's men told him to kill Saul. But instead he said to them, and this is why I believe in instances like this, where it's recorded in God's word that he was a man after God's own heart. What did he say? The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, saying he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stared his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul, but Saul rose up out of the cave and he went his way. David could have easily went over and put the spear or the sword into Saul and been finished with Saul. And he would never have found himself in this situation. But he didn't. It 
Everything was against David, as I've said, for a large part of his life. And here, circumstance was against him. But I want you to understand this morning, I want you to see this morning, that circumstances can be against us. But as the children of God, God is for us. We can find ourselves in difficult or impossible situations. But he's with us. He can perform the miracle. He can turn the circumstance around in an instant. And that's what he did for David. Not at this time. God allowed this to happen in David's life. He wasn't standing up tall to this giant Goliath. I'll take him. He wasn't turning around to his soul and saying, I'm going to slay him. At this stage in his life. And the way he found himself saying in his heart, I'm not going to die. One day this soul's going to kill me. I shall now perish. To me, the real test of the Christian walk is how we treat others. I mean, that, that is so true. Especially those who do us wrong. And David is a perfect example. And that is why he found favor with God. That is why God called him a man after his own heart. It's interesting to know that Samuel said these words to Saul about David being a man after his own heart, after Saul had sinned against God. You see, Saul didn't obey God's instructions in the war against the Amalekites. Samuel anointed David as the next king, but Saul sought to kill David and prevent him from taking up the kingship. So David fled from Saul. Of course, David became king in 2 Samuel 5. But first he was only tribe of his own, or sorry, he was only king of his own tribe, Judah. And then he would be king of all of Israel. Now David here is saying, I'm going to perish. What a wrong thought that was. And I'm asking you this morning, dear friends, about even your thought in the last day or your thought in the last week or your thought in the last month, something that can come into our lives unexpectedly. We maybe had a, we started off the day rejoicing with God, rejoicing in his word, rejoicing in a time of prayer, and then all of a sudden, a thought can come into our head. Will God prove to David that it was not a thought from him? And God proved to David that it was a wrong thought, and God had proved to David his deliverances, his faithfulness in the past. And there, there was not the slightest possibility that this thought that David was now having would ever or could ever come to pass because God was no longer with Saul. God's focus was now 100% focused on David. And the thoughts just uh, coming to me now, but so true. 
that here is David with his back against a wall, totally defeated and totally discouraged, just like his brethren was whenever they came against Goliath. Now David finds himself in the same situation and he's broken and he's defeated and he, 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 he just wants to hang his head in shame. But it's always darkest just before the dawn. And Saul was about, well Saul was about to commit suicide. David didn't know that. Just in a chapter or two later, we, I think it's chapter 29, where Saul fell on his own sword. God knew. David didn't know. David had been running from Saul for years. David had the opportunity on more than one occasion to take Saul's life, and he didn't do it. Because David feared God. Sometimes, dear friends, people do things that are wrong against us. Sometimes, we, if we're honest, we can feel hurt. I think that hurt is always stronger in the church. Maybe we've been friends with someone for years. But all of a sudden, things go wrong. Thoughts can arise, good and bad. But it's what we do with those thoughts. It's where we direct our thoughts. Because the thoughts that David was having wasn't right. And they led him to, down a path of discouragement. They led him down a path of defeat. They led him down a path from even the very presence of God. You know, when this situation in, in, in David's life, David wasn't singing any psalms. David wasn't composing any songs. David wasn't in a relationship with God. He worked with God. God had his hand completely upon David. And no matter how far into the land of Philistines that David found himself, God's hand was upon him. Because God loved him. God was about to deliver him. But God allowed him to experience this situation. David didn't know why. Could it be, dear friends, that you're afraid of <coughs> something this morning? Could it be afraid? Could it be a case that you're afraid of someone this morning? Could it be that they're pursuing you with the intent of damaging you or discouraging or fighting against you? Could you feel like King David felt? Could that be your feeling this morning? God will prove faithful. He will deliver you. He will give you the victory. I mean, I consider myself a simple guy. What I do sometimes when I'm in a difficult situation or a I come up against a difficult person or I ask myself, why am I in this situation? I always ask the question, Keith, when was the last time God forsook you? When? And I always come up with the same answer. No. He's never forsaken me once. But, but I've been praying for something for years and this situation's not changing. 
In fact, this situation is getting worse. It's getting darker. It's getting duller. Losing the fight. The bag's against the wall. Well, David wrote in Psalm 46 and verse 1 that God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Dear friends, it might not be a person pursuing you. It could be an illness or it could be a doubt. It could be a fear. But whatever it is that is pursuing and praise God of nothing is pursuing at the minute. But for the child of God, it's a life of a battle. We're in a war against the evil one. And the word of God says is that he's a raging lion, he's roaring, and he's seeking whom he may devour. And if we're not in a battle or in trouble now, we could be just hours away from it. We could be just days away from it. We could be just months away from it. But if we can remember this morning that God is our refuge, <coughs> God is our strength, and God is our very present help in trouble. Now, David didn't only have one trouble. If there was a man who had trouble in his life, it was certainly King David. Dear friends, trouble comes into our lives. That's just the way life is. David didn't need to fear that day that one day he would perish at the hand of Saul. Because David, when he was a shepherd boy, David had proved his God. And we don't need, have time to go into 1 Samuel chapter 17. But David, through God, defied the army of the Philistines. And he divided the giant leader of the Philistines. He proved his God. He knew who his God was. And even when David slew the lion, before he stood before, David, before Goliath, as a young sheep boy, David was out in the land on his own and David slew a lion and a bear. David knew his God. And he knew that his God had delivered him in the past. And maybe deep down, David knew that one day God would deliver him. And God did deliver him. The beauty about being a Christian is that we too have this hope. When trouble comes, our God is in the midst to defend us. It's all good saying this, but why did David go through this? I know, personally speaking this morning, I've asked the same question, Lord, why have you allowed this to happen? And you have asked that question. And maybe in the house of God this morning, you're asking that question. Lord, why is this happening? It could be over a husband or a wife. It could be over a child that once walked with God and now they're no longer. God, why has it happened? It could be over a, fr a friend or a spouse that we've prayed for for years. David learned so much through his experiences. And if you go on down the chapter, you read that he asks for a land. And you read in verse 3 there that he was dwelling with Achish. And then he goes on to say, he says, at the end of verse 5, if I've now found favor, grace in thy eyes, 
Let them give me a place or some town in the country that I may dwell there. As I said before, he was planning to stay. He, he wasn't going back to the land of Judah. He wasn't going back to God's people. He was planning to stay with the Philistines. The same shepherd boy that slew the Philistine is now under King Achish, another Philistine. And here he gives him the land of Siglag. And this is where David would have learned so much in the land of Siglag. It prepared him for the future that God had planned for him. I say this because God's plan, and nothing will ever alter God's plan, but God's plan for David was not just that he would be king of Judah, but God's plan for David that he would be king of all of Israel. We look forward to the time when the Lord will return. It says he will sit upon the throne of King David. You see, God had a plan not only for David's life, but God had a plan for the end of time. That he would come back and dwell amongst his people. When he was on the cross and they forsook him, and even his disciples forsook him, and his own people rejected him, and he was on the cross alone, one day he would sit upon the throne of David as the king of all the earth. Dear friends, that's what you and I have to look forward to. That's another story. But God's love for the Jewish people. Sometimes we can look under the TV and we can, we can ask, well, why is all this going on? Because it's all recorded in Scripture. And you think it's bad now for Israel? Wait till the tribulation comes. Wait till the time of Jacob's, not the churches, not the Gentiles, but wait for the time of Jacob's trouble. Wait till the time that the Lord is dealing with Israel. Dear friends, we may not always know what God is doing. But as I heard years ago, we might not always understand the hand of God. But we can trust the heart of God. So if you find yourself in a circumstance or a situation this morning that you don't know, you can't understand, you can't work it out, you're worried about that son or you're worried about that daughter. You're worried about that husband. You're worried about that wife. You're worried about that mother. You're worried about that. Well, dear friends, rest in God. Trust in God. Because God was the one that was faithful to David. And God is the one that will be faithful to you. You don't need to doubt God this morning. You don't need to fear God in that sense this morning. We need to fear God in his awesomeness and his, and his majesty and that kind of fear. But we don't need to be afraid as the world is afraid. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. That's the, what the Lord said to his people. We shouldn't have troubled hearts this morning. I think our hearts get troubled when we look on the situations instead of looking at God. God allowed David to feel like this. But this situation, this feeling, should I say, wasn't of God. 
but he allowed it. And God used this situation and God gave David Siglag and God was preparing him for a time whenever he would be king over all Israel. Dear friends, time is gone and that's what God is doing in each of our lives this morning. David himself was to find encouragement of his God. He needed encouraged because in 1 Samuel 29, Achor sent David away because the Philistines distrusted him. They distrusted him. Do you know that David went so far that if you go to chapter 28, he went to fight against Israel with the Philistines. And Achish put him at the back of the army. And then the leaders asked, what's David doing there? We're not fighting with him. Do you think God was going to allow the future king of Israel to fight against his people? And then they took David out. Then David went back to Siglag. And then it was destroyed. The wives and the children were taken. Then the people started to turn against David. Then they blamed David. And it was David's fault. David should never have been in Siglag. David should never have been in a situation in his heart where he was doubting God and where he was saying, I'm now going to perish in the hands of Saul. But David did what each of us need to do in situations where we find ourselves in those situations. David encouraged himself in the Lord. David turned his eyes again unto God. David then began to pray again. David then began to write songs and psalms again. David's heart rejoiced again in his God. And God returned unto David all of his spoil. God had a purpose. David didn't know what it was. God had a plan. David didn't know what it was. In fact, David ran from it. Just like Jonah ran from it. God had a plan for the Ninevites. God's got a plan for the lost. We get asked the question, well, why is the church decreasing? Why is people leaving? Why is people no more interested in the things of God? Well, I believe, it's as, as the word of God says, in the time of the end, many shall depart from the truth. Many will go down into the land of the Philistines and seek refuge away from God's people. And dear friends, it's good that each of us find ourselves in the house of God this morning. It's good that God has saved us, isn't it? I mean, where else would you rather be? Because I can tell you, Colleen, Dullingstown, where I'm from, Belfast, London, Washington, Paris, there's nothing to offer. David got back into the place where he should have been with God. He had experienced the Philistines. He took 600 men with him. A lot were murdered, a lot were killed. 
David went back with God. Dear friends, I don't know what your situation is this morning. Maybe you come to church, maybe you don't. Maybe your heart's not where it once was. Well, instead of saying, I shall now perish at the hands of such and such, at the hand of the thing that I ran to, maybe it's time to let go, to come back to Christ, our only refuge, our only strength in time of trouble. Would you not praise him? Would you not worship God this morning? We're only here for a fraction. It's just a fraction. It's all just going. You know, and I will close with this. My, my brother's doing so well in life, and he really is, and he's got a, such a great job, and his wife as well, and they're high flyers. And he's bought about his sixth house. Before. Four or five hundred thousand pounds, doing really well in life. Doesn't know God. He's 52 years old. No interest in the things of God. And I just said to him, I congratulated him, and I said, Richard, you leave it all behind. I'm not knocking anybody for having wealth. There's nothing wrong with it if it's done right. But you know, he thought about it and he looked at me and he said, you know, I needed that. I needed that. It's not there forever. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's sing our final hymn this morning and sing out to our great